Welcome to the Cycling Goals podcast. It is what it says on the tin. It's all about your cycling goals. If you're a cyclist living in 2018, then you really should have a cycling goal. So hit us up on social media, hashtag cycling goals 2018, so that we can hear about them, get motivated, inspired by them, and ultimately hold you to them. In this episode, I speak to Geetis, a cyclist and coach from Hawaii. Other than talking about being envious of the terrain and climate he gets to ride in, we also talk about the importance of planning out the steps towards your goal, what actually makes a good cycling goal, and also, are you able to reach your potential fueled predominantly on fruit? I haven't seen you since Thailand, but... um... Yeah, we did a lot of cycling there, and you you really pushed yourself in Thailand, didn't you? I did. Yeah, man, it was um, the biggest three week block of training I've ever done. Um, I remember the last week I pumped out about eight hundred kilometers, and to me that was my biggest week ever. And it was just like that that week was just intensity every other day. So I uh, I did push myself quite quite a bit, man. But I I reap the rewards but definitely after i got back home i was finished i had to like actually take a recovery week which i've never experienced I, i've never thought like recovery weeks like were needed but like when you do a serious training block or i kind of felt like i was like doing stage races at that point because i was pumping out you know like you know around 100 kilometers a day or maybe less than yeah about 100 kilometers a day and um you know, I was giving intensity every, every other week. So after that week, I definitely felt cooked and I, I could relate like to professional bike riders <laughs> and, and what they experience after a, a long stage race like that. Um, so yeah, man, I, that was a, that was some serious training for me. I learned a lot from that though. Yeah, I bet. Was that your peak? Do you think last year? No, nah, man, I think I actually peaked earlier because my best Dude, well, the funny thing is that all in Thailand, I didn't even have a power meter. Um, my flight there, I lost my I lost my Garmin pedal pod, so I was riding with no power meter the whole time in Thailand. Just kind of a bummer because I I wasn't able to see what my power was. But yeah, I felt like I peaked a little bit earlier. Like Thailand was in June, and I started my training uh, in January, where I started throwing in intervals and time trials weekly. And um, I've never, actually never structured my training like that before, where I, you know, I set out to actually do intervals. I used to just be a joy rider. I would just go out and do adventure rides. And I started including like time trials once a week or an interval session once a week, just once a week. But on top, of course, a lot of zone two endurance. Yeah. Um, and I was putting in like 10 hours plus on the bike but maybe one session of intensity, which was maybe 20 or 30 minutes. And then every week I was just increasing my FTP. I was doing a time trial once a week. It was like 300 and then 310 and then 315. And then it got up to 337 at one point. Really? And I, I then I plateaued. I was trying to uh, excel past 337. I plateaued and then I think my fitness might have dropped a little bit, but who knows? Like I didn't have a power meter, but mm. I know I was either at my peak fitness or I was close, close to it's it. It's funny. I was from my observation of uh, watching your videos, um, just sort of looking at your journey. I I could totally see that you were right, you know, joy rider, and then because I remember when it came to Thailand, I th- I expected you to arrive. Uh, thinking in the back of my mind, oh yeah, he's just a joy rider, you know. Like, but you were hungry, <laughs> like for the for the time up the up Doisa Tep, you know. You were you were really going for it, and it was like I could tell that you had gotten like the bug of uh, of you know intensity. That's hilarious, man. Um, yeah, <laughs> I I always had that. I always had the intention of being becoming a fast bike rider. I just didn't know what to do. Yeah, I did didn't. I. I didn't understand this world of interval training and, and doing high intensity to get fitter. I thought, I don't know what I was thinking, to be honest. Yeah, I, don't know. I guess you don't really think about these things until you try them. They're put in front of you and you you get a taste for it. Yeah, it, it's funny. I just thought like, you know, you're supposed to get you're supposed to get fitter every intense ride you do. And it's like, 
uh, I just thought, you know, every group ride I'll go on, you know, from, from this day on, I'm going to get faster and faster. And, and, um, then I realized that wasn't the case. And, um, yeah, I started dabbling with higher intensity training and, and, uh, saw the benefits of it. Yeah. So do you think you just, it had benefits beyond your cycling? You know, I mean, you just feel better day to day or was, did it become a bit of an obsession? You know, <laughs> like what was, what was driving you? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Ash. Um, of course, you're going to get leaner once you up the intensity. Um, it's obviously the faster you're going to ride up hills. Um, it's like the body starts to adapt and starts shredding off that, making you leaner so you can fly mm-hmm. up those hills. And um, I was doing a lot of uphill time trials at the time. And um, yeah, it was just absolutely rewarding to go put down an amazing effort. And it was my f- first time like really like dabbling with high intensity again. And um, I would do like 30 minute efforts and it would just be a battle. And um, every time I'd finish, I'd be just so proud of myself yeah. because, you know, and I would just improve every single, every single hard effort. Cause I just did base training. I, I, you know, I wasn't like riding like two or three times a week. I was riding almost every day, but I was just doing volume and I would ride at least 10 hours a week. So I had all this zone two base fitness. So when I started including, uh, you know, higher intensities, you know, I just started getting better and better. And it was just, it was definitely motivational. Um, it was, it definitely boosted my confidence to put down more power like that. Yeah. I think um, you hit the nail on the head with the battle. It feels like such a battle between your mind and body. And then when, you, when you're done, you just, yeah, it's euphoria, isn't it? I'm sure there's chemicals, the, the dopamine or whatever gets released and you get addicted to that. But yeah, there's so much about um, intensity that uh, it just interests me. Like there's, there's something about it that, uh, that like I, I said, I've said this before on some videos where, um, you know, some people love, I think it's just, it's all about the challenge, but some people love to travel hundreds and hundreds of miles doing Audax riding and they love that and they love the battle of that, of that, but I like my home comforts and I like, but, and so I like to do just quick half an hour efforts, like in, instantly you dive into your mind and you know, it's a battle between your body and your mind uh, for 30 minutes and it's something that you can, you can't, replicate unless you go for hundreds of miles doing like audax riding you know the the same feeling you get from you know days on end riding you can get from just doing a quick like a time trial because it's all about you versus yourself basically you know and that's what i think i like about it is that it doesn't involve anybody else and it's all about you know it sort of it shows you what you're made of those sort of intense efforts the sort of time trials uphill and stuff Definitely. And, uh, one thing, one other thing is definitely kind of shapes you as a person. Yeah. If you're going out there by yourself for 30 minutes and going full gas and putting yourself through some serious suffering, that's definitely going to build some character. It's going to build some strength and some mental fortitude in your personality. So it's going to, it's going to result to other aspects of your life and, and having that determination and having that will to suffer and, and to tolerate pain so if you got any like, you know, if you're working or you're trying to build a business, you know, try pushing pushing yourself through maybe like late nights or, you know, hard work sessions, it's gonna you, your your performance on the bike and the confidence you get from that is gonna transfer on onto your daily life. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, man. And because at the moment, are you are you coaching? Is that part of what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, man, it's uh, it's pretty cool, but I um. I started coaching a few a uh, uh, few athletes. Uh, I'm I'm cycling coaching two athletes, and I'm just doing some basic fitness coaching for one. And um, it's been really good so far. You're trying to make a sustainable lifestyle where you get to cycle all the time. Is that what you're trying to do at the moment? Like, and how are you doing that? Yeah, or, or like trying to be a part of the sport in some way. You know, coaching other cyclists. Right now, I do it online, so I'm doing it through Skype sessions. I'm doing through sending training plans weekly for them via email. Um, you know, I feel like when you're really passionate about something, 
I think they're, I mean, you know, I'm so young. I'm only 22. I can't really give business advice or anything. But for me, like, I'm willing to take this risk. I have this freedom. And I really, for me, what's important is not to make a lot of money, but it's just to do what I love. And I feel like when you're so passionate about something, I think you can potentially make that passion into a profession. And um, I feel like I, ha- I do have this talent, this gift to be so, so uh, dedicated and consistent with my training. I mean, if you look at my Strava, if you look on Strava, there's not a lot of weeks I miss in training. And it has a lot to do with just my addictive personality. Yeah. And just athletics are just in my blood. It's just what I've always done growing up. And um, I feel like that's something I could teach to other people is ingraining that habit and keeping them motivated. So with cycling coaching, you know, I'm not necessarily training like high, you know, world-class high, you know, elite level athletes, you know, definitely not athletes that are even have a threshold over 300 Watts because that gets a little bit more complicated, but like athletes who are just starting out uh, on the bike or, you know, have a threshold somewhere around 250 and like they want to get to 300s and, and where I've gotten up to, to, to 337, like I know what to do. I know what it takes to do that. So I, I love helping out other athletes to get there. And a lot of these athletes just need like some support and just need someone to keep them accountable and keep them motivated. Cause a lot of them, you know, either get into a kind of, uh, you know, a, a training plan that overwhelms them and they possibly overtrain and they just completely burn out. So they need a little bit of guidance in that direction, but just someone to always come back to just to keep them motivated to not stop. Cause a lot of people struggle with consistency and that's something that's kind of ingrained with me. And I think it can bring motivation to other people with that. For sure. That's, that's a good way to segue into, cause we can bring, we can come back to talk about their goals and what you've learned from other people's goals, but we want to talk about your goals for 2018. Like what are your, have you got a list or is there just one big one? Right. So on the cycling goals, 2018 Facebook group, I wrote down a few things. Um, I wanted to win two bike races. Um, one is called cycle to the sun and the other one's called see the stars. So you can imagine that there, these two races have a lot of climbing in them. Both of them have at least 9,000 feet of climbing in metrics. That would be about 3000 meters. So, um, races that are just uphill for about 40, 50 miles. And I really would like to win them. I really would like to win them. I'm getting real skinny for it. <laughs> and um, and um, skinny I on think, fruit, right? It's just skinny yeah, on fruit. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's my my diet is predominantly fruit based. And okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Cool. Um, and but the thing right now is uh, I am training for a marathon. So you know, I'm I'm doing a lot of running training at the moment, which might be <laughs> the wrong podcast for this, but. Um, after my marathon that I competed in March, I'm then going to get into, uh, to serious cycling training to get prepared for these bike races. Um, they're not humongous races. I mean, definitely all the locals, all the, the best locals show up in Hawaii. There's not like this huge cycling community with like, uh, pros flooding the streets around here, like maybe Boulder, Colorado or Tucson, Arizona, but you know, there's some, there's some solid guys there, some, some, some skinny guys too, you know, definitely lighter than me. And, um, I think I can build up to it. I think I have, I think I'm more intelligent with my, uh, with my training plans. So I'm going to aim to try to win those bike races and then some other goals. Um, I, I, uh, I want to ride my bike around the big Island. So I moved to the Big Island about a year ago, so complete drastic change from living in a cold climate in in New England, um, in the U.S., um, moving over here. So I've always wanted to ride around around the Big Island. It's 250 miles. Well, I want to try to do that in one day, so it could be maybe a 15-hour ride, and I think I can pull that off no problem. I just got to have that mental fortitude to push on. Yeah, and then pick the right day. 
I definitely wouldn't want rain because it, it can get pretty rainy. It's pretty spotty around here, the Big Island. There's so much change in elevation. You know, you can easily get hit with a bunch of rain. But And then I, I'd like to do a triathlon. Um, so I watched, I, I spectated the Ironman World Championships in Kona this past October. And uh, I really got in, immersed into the triathlon culture a little bit. And mm. I saw like, how big this event was. Yeah. I mean, you got, I, I believe you have like one to 2000, uh, age group athletes competing. And then you got 50, 50 men and 50 women competing for the, the pro, uh, the pro overall. And, um, and then it's like all these athletes have families from all over the world. So like this one day in Kona, like, or, or a couple of weeks, you know, a lot of athletes come before or go on vacation sightseeing stuff you know how big of a deal this is like the event is completely packed and it was absolutely motivating to be there and to be to be there to be there for an event that is, is grueling you know for the average for the pro if you guys don't know what an Ironman is uh, it's a it's a triathlon and it consists of a 2.4 mile swim uh, 112 mile bike ride and 26.2 mile uh, run and it's a grueling event and athletes put themselves through you know sometimes misery and, and sometimes amazing success and I was really inspired by that and I saw how big of a deal this was so I kind of want to take a dabble into triathlon and I do enjoy running. So do you, th- do you think one of, one of the things that makes a good goal is uh, is the unknown like you know you don't you, this is something new. Absolutely man uh, I this, so I've been doing these long runs and it's like, I'm trying to increase my mileage, uh, see how far I can run in one day. I'm going from like 14 to 18 and I just did 22 miles yesterday. And, uh, one thing that really excites me, uh, is the fear is the mm. unknowingness of like, are you going to make it? Are my legs going to give out? You know, is my meniscus going to start flaring up? <laughs> that unknowingness, that fear is, uh, is important in goal setting. I think, yeah. I think that's what really, um, it makes things exciting. Yeah, for sure. I, and I, I heard, um, on a quote on one of your videos is, is where you were saying it's not about perfection in your, when you're striving, you know, to, to get somewhere with your goals, it's all about the progression. Like as long as you're progressing, then that is the, I mean, the, 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 the surefire way to progress uh, um, probably most efficiently is to have a goal and uh and the, the best goals i think are ones where you're not quite sure if you can do it or not you know, there's a, there's a lot of unknown yeah totally totally man. yeah I just, um, I, just feel, I just feel like then the search to sort of shine a light on on the unknowns it just makes everything else so much stronger so like it just lights a fire underneath you and makes you want to strive harder <laughs> to to you know i mean like it's I'm trying to think like with your with the triathlon one it's it's also a two part thing because you've got um this amazing event that you know your goal is to be part of that you've seen other people doing it and you're like oh, I want to be one of those people doing it because I want to I want to be part of this event and then also it you've got the the running side of it uh, specifically where you're you're not quite sure that you can do this yet but you've got an inkling and it's like well if I do this you know it's it's cool. I think that's the perfect way to set a goal is to, you know, look, look at what you're scared of, the fear, like you said, or uh, just where something is completely unknown, like beyond your limit. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, yeah, I think it's super important, definitely. Yeah, I mean, like with, um, yeah, I did, cause, because the thing is, I mean, every, a lot of the times with with training for a lot of these things, even the even the intense efforts that you have to go through, they're kind of your, you become fearful of the pain in the beginning, I guess. And you kind of have to embrace it. And like we were saying before, it kind of teaches you lessons for the rest of life to do with fears <laughs> and, and confronting sure. those fears. For sure. And I think a good goal is one that makes you really confront those fears and it transfers over into real life. Because I think like for other people, if they're out there setting their goals, um, they should always look for things that are, are going to make them fearful because otherwise, you know, you, I don't think you progress. And I think it's all about progression. I think it's all about right. 
you know, going on a journey that you never thought you were going to go on. <laughs> and yeah, you only, you only have so much time in a year. You only have so many events you can compete in. You only got so many uh, phases and, and training blocks to uh, chase after these goals. So, you know, goals are fantastic because you, every time you're, you're in pursuit of a goal, you're starting, uh, you're starting your training plan. Um, and basically you're going to go through the phases. You're going to build a base. You're going to, you're going to build a foundation. You're going to build it. And then you're going to do race specific work or, or goal specific work to uh, try to achieve that goal. And it's like, you're kind of building this house, for instance, you're building foundation and you're building it up to the roof. And once you get to the goal, you know, if it's intense enough, you might completely destroy your house essentially because, you know, it's such an intense event and you're going to need some recovery after. So the more time you go through those phases, the fitter and, and the fitter you're going to get. So it's, um, it's good that you have a lot of goals. So I'm trying to plan all my goals like every three months or every, every, yeah, every three months, every four months. So I have, so I have enough time to go through these phases and, um, that's the way you're going to progress is just building that house up, destroying it and then rebuilding it up for each event and each goal. Of course you can, you don't have to peak for each event if maybe you just, using it maybe for training or you're using it, um, you know, just for fun. But if you're going for like a goal all the time, maybe you're going for an Ironman or if you're going for a couple Ironmans, you know, it, it's just, it's, that's the way to build fitness in my opinion is just, um, keep going through these phases and keep trying to build that roof taller and taller. Yeah. I like that. Are you, are you mimic, are you trying to mimic in the training plans that you provide for other people how you train you're mimicking how you're training what you've learned and uh creating templates for them in similar ways um yeah definitely um i'm gonna be 100 percent 100 percent honest when i when i started coaching um i did understand that like after my training blocks in thailand and yeah and just, that that training block in thailand taught me a lot it taught me that idea of building this pyramid, building this house. It's like I started in January and I guess all year round, I was thinking about Thailand and I wanted to <laughs> get a fast, you know, Doisa Tep PR. So basically all my motivation to train all year round was for Thailand and seeing how much I progressed over the year. And, um, my real training kicked in in December and, you know, I, I had a, a base level of fitness and then I got into kind of, uh, goal specific training when I'm trying to do like 30 minute, you know, time trial efforts, just like I would be, uh, for Doisa tap. And, um, and, um, it taught me that, you know, that there's these phases that you go through, you need a solid foundation and then you need to build it up and then you do the race, uh, goal specific work and then you have your event. And then my event was Thailand and, um, the, the blocks of training I did there kind of totally destroyed my house, for instance. And, that, and when I got home, my threat, I was like, I would, I would go for a, for a 20 minute, like FTP test. And I wasn't even able to hold 300 watts. Yeah. Or like yeah. six months ago, I was able to do 337. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? I thought this Thailand trip was supposed to make me fitter. But when you do a serious training block like that, you've kind of destroyed your house and you got to rebuild it. And doesn't mean like you're starting from ground zero. You might be starting at a better place than where you started in that first house that you built. And, um, and then, um, and, but you obviously get, get back quicker to that same, um, that same level of fitness. Um, and maybe even higher, but I've learned that you have to go through these phases to rebuild your fitness. So, um, so with my clients, I have the same idea. If they're just a bare bones beginner cyclist, I'm just going to make sure that their body can function um, under a certain amount of volume of training. And then I'll add the intensity. Once they got a, a solid foundation in them, a solid base to be able to, to do these uh, higher intensity training to get them essentially as fit as possible. So it, it got me thinking a lot about training and, and training phases and specifically volume and 
what a what a typical training phase involves. Yeah. So do the, do you set them goals, or do they have goals themselves? Do you encourage them to bring goals. Yeah, they have they have goals themselves. Um, so I had one client that had a goal of hitting two hundred fifty watts. Um, I got one client that uh, for a threshold for a FTP, and then I have an, another client that just wants to lose weight. And um, the first client, I was able to get his. Uh, we we were able to get his FTP from. 154 watts to 250 watts in three months and that was with um absolutely no intensity training really? that was wow. all that was all volume and base training and i think it speaks for base training um because this athlete struggled with overtraining, getting into to high intensity too quick and then burning out and i i think when especially as a beginner cyclist, if you got no mileage in your background you need these base miles and, and just that alone, I was, you know, and I, I have that experience to time workouts. Like, you know, maybe when we were beginners, we didn't really know when we were, we were fully recovered or what should have been the workout the day before an FTP test. So I was, I'm able, I have that experience to able to time that right for, to have his best effort on that day. And, um, and yeah, so he got up to 250 Watts. Now we're, dabbling with trying to get him up to 300 and and one one client you know he's in his late 40s and um he got he dropped he dropped below 200 pounds for the first time in 17 years wow which just is absolutely humbling but it's not just the training yeah it has a lot to do with just tweaking the diet for sure. If you're, I, and, I, and, yeah i think weight the, i think weight loss personally i think is is more to do with diet than it is training in my experience Absolutely. And the tweak, I'm going to give this the secret to the viewers, to the audience, but the hack we made was um, we simply took grains out of the diet. We didn't completely eliminate them, but we took a lot of the rice out. Um, and he, and he, and I, I told him to start eating sweet potatoes and taro, this Hawaiian, Hawaiian native root. And um, the weight just started coming right off. I'm sure the, the fitness he was I'm sure the fitness he was doing helped, um, but he he did feel like he did feel like he wasn't overeating on rice, and it, it's kind of a little bit harder to overeat on potatoes Absolutely. and um, yeah and roots because they're just a little bit higher in volume. I totally agree with you. It's the fiber. It's there's I I can testify to that because I mean I I went on a bit of a weight loss plan, you know, and really it, it just involved. Uh, increasing the amount of potatoes, uh, you know, same amount of carbs, but uh, just increasing the amount of potatoes. And just because of how a potato is, you know, you get fuller for longer. You know, there's because of all there's so much fiber, and it's yeah, like you said, it's very e- hard to overeat on potatoes. Whereas on rice, you can eat quite a lot of it and not not get full. <laughs> and so yeah, it just works out that way that you lose weight because it is so much to do with diet. You know, losing weight, getting lean, which is a good segue onto you know how how you've been able to you know get so lean and stay so lean and you know because of how, where you live basically you know Hawaii is, ama- is amazing for fruit right F- perfect cycling fuel yeah it's definitely amazing for fruit and, and the weather conditions I've always found that I've I've been leaner in tropical climates over the winter I found in in cold places I, I'm not able to stay as lean. I think the body has something to do with it and trying to keep you warm and trying to put on more mass. Um, and um, yeah, the fruit is amazing. Um, I I've been dabbling again with the uh, 100% raw vegan diet um, for the longest time. I was eating raw till four for about like four years. Uh, you know, I've always been in this like raw food scene. Always go to this fruit fruit festival in upstate New York. It's called the Woodstock Fruit Festival. So I've been around that community, and um, I've been starting to dabble with raw foods again now. And 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 speaking of high volume, low calorie foods that are uh, hard to overeat on, fruits and vegetables in their in their raw fresh form um, are even are are even have those properties even more so. Um, so when we talk about potatoes are slimming, I'm taking it to like a whole another extreme <laughs> where I'm just eating fruit. Yeah. And this stuff is rich in water, rich in fiber, 
And it's like a pound of strawberries is 140 calories. Yeah, it's you know, crazy. A pound, of, a pound of nuts or a pound of dry rice, um, you know, it's going to be a lot more calories. It's going to be up in the thousands. So, so I'm, I'm filling my body up. I'm just flooding my body with nutrition. Yeah, that's the right word, flooding. You are, you know, you're flooding your body with exactly the right nutrition. Right, and, and, and I'm, I'm also flooding myself with water and fiber. So I think my, my satiation triggers are more on point rather than when I'm eating like just white rice with like soy sauce. I think it might be a little bit harder for me to stop eating when I'm eating just rice and soy sauce. It's a little bit more stimulating um, for me personally. Eating fruit, um, you're, I'm always coming out feeling light and I never feel like I overeat. Um, just cause I'm so filled up with water and fiber. Yeah. Mm, and, um, it's, yeah. Ex- sorry, my guy. It's extremely, yeah, it's extremely beneficial for weight loss. Um, I, I've definitely noticed, um, I did a 30 days raw experiment back in November. I'm still doing it again now. I'm like three, three weeks in, but the whole December I was kind of failing. It's, it's a really hard, it's a hard diet to sustain, but the benefits are worth it for me, but um, I did 30 days without without really changing the volume of training I was doing. I was probably cycling 10 plus hours a week, just like normally. And uh, I switched over to a raw vegan diet, and um, I dropped 15 pounds. And I'm not like a heavy guy. I was I was just at 160 pounds, and I dropped down to 145, which is um, some serious watt per kg gains. Yeah, um, for sure. And my power didn't really drop either. Um, I, I feel like I was overeating and I think I was just carrying like, you know, useless weight on me. So doing this 30 day raw experiment, I'm like, damn, like I actually feel like an athlete. I feel super lean. Um, I, I'm eating as much as I care for. Um, but at the same time, like the, this food, this fresh fruits and vegetables kind of tricks you to thinking you're eating more, but you're, you're actually eating less calories. And, um, that's that's really the secret of this that's the that's the hack of this diet yeah, for weight loss for sure i mean the the other thing is you know there's so many gains to be had with that way of eating you know and you say you dropped 15 pounds it, you know you're always going to re- retain the power because one you know your blood is you're not going to be deficient in anything so the you know, most important thing your blood is still going to be like just as good as it was before and then you know you're not your body isn't going to have adapted to uh you know mu- muscle atrophy you know you're not going to have lost any muscle mass either so you're just going to completely retain all the power that you had before and just without that weight wasted weight that you were carrying which is um the thing i was thinking the thing that i really envy about um you know you living it living in hawaii and you know with all this fruit and stuff is that with the fruit you also get to ride a lot at the same time <laughs> and i think the two go together really well yeah, definitely. Um, like I can, I can imagine what I would look like, what how fit I would be if I lived in Hawaii would be very different to London, say, because you know, today I went out on a ride and I had all the intention in the world to just shred every hill I could come across, but you know, I'm taking in lungfuls of nitrogen dioxide from cars and you know, I'm I'm getting pulled out on by vans and just just what like wattage wattage suppressing traffic that uh you know my my ambition is not being matched by my terrain and i just i dream of hawaii and fruit <laughs> yeah yeah man. man yeah tropical weather hills and fruit just essentials for weight loss um and it's like when i want to go to the grocery store or i want to go to the post office like I essentially got to climb like a thousand feet straight away. <laughs> and and that might be just like, a, to me to get to the post office is 10 kilometers. Yeah. And it's like, I already climb a thousand feet in 10 kilometers. I would love that, um, man. I go out of my way to try and climb a thousand feet before I get to the post office. I have to take like <laughs> a 25 mile route away from the post office and then come back again and try and cover that kind of elevation. Yeah, man. That's awesome. <laughs> starting this podcast i've and the instagram and the facebook group you know listening to all different people's goals i was thinking do you think it's better to have one goal like at the top of this pyramid and then everything else filters off of it or do you think it's good to have lots of mini goals i mean 
like for me for my 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 in my mind i can think of nothing else but this one goal my goal of you know getting past 5 watts per kilo as my ftp and but the thing is i know i just i i've got that in clear focus and then i know that everything else will f- sort of dangle off of it that anything else that i want to achieve you know like getting some sort of kom or whatever it is any everything else follows if i just in clear having clear focus you know me hurtling towards you know my one five watt per kilo goal and everything else follows or do you think it's better to have lots of other goals i mean how do you feel about that yeah so i i think that i think that's highly variable depending on the person and at the same time i don't think i've experimented enough with goal setting as an athlete i feel like this year is my real year where I'm at, where I'm setting my goals. And I, I guess I'll learn because last year I kind of just focused on, on doing my best in Thailand. And this year I have, I have three, three races lined up that I want to perform in. So I'm going to learn that from my experience, whether what's going to be more beneficial. Um, but just, just what I'm seeing, um, I, I think, just whatever seems funnest to you, you know, cause for me, I'm a little bit anxious. I'm like, I want to start racing now. And like, I already got like a marathon plan. And it's like, I don't want to wait six months for these bike races in, in the summer. And, um, I think three months of three months of, uh, of different phases of training will help me get to that, to that race pretty solid. So I, I feel like I can set myself up with a few different goals in the year. Um, but it also depends on your goal. I mean, I'm sure. Like, are you planning to do any races at um, all this year? I, I don't know. No, I, that's the, that's what I'm saying. I'm like, I'm so obsessed with this one thing that I don't really. Everything else is sort of coming second to it, and I don't. I, you know, if I don't really, if I'm not obsessed with it, then I, I it sort of falls off my radar. <laughs> so I'm not really thinking about any races. But I know that if I get to do any races, then. Um, five watts per kilo will be all right. <laughs> yeah, definitely, man. Um, yeah, that's cool. I, I respect that a lot. Um, I, th- I think you're right though. I think it's from person to person, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very obsessive personality where like I'll do everything to extremes. So once I've knocked this off, you know, I'll do something else to another extreme. <laughs> but the thing is, I think the problem with what I'm doing is maybe, you know, uh, so I've just struck, I've just created a structured training plan. And I guess those will be like mini goals, but, um, you know, it could be all like putting all your eggs in one basket and you could get disillusioned at some point in the year and just think that it's not what you want anymore. And I don't know. Yeah, it just feels like maybe it's not the best idea to have one thing that you're obsessed with <laughs> that's going to take a while or, to get to. Yeah, or, or maybe it is, you know, like I'm looking at my year now. It's like I have these races lined up like do, and sometimes I'm feeling like, you know, maybe I'd, maybe it's not enough time like you know, after my, uh, marathon in March is, you know, March 18th. And then I got a bike race June 18th. I I believe that's three months. And it's like, what if three months isn't enough, you know? So I'm going to learn that the hard way. Like maybe, maybe sticking to one or two goals would have been better than going for three races and, and, and kind of being crunched on time. So, I mean, if you, if you really want a goal, I mean, I'd go tunnel vision and go, you yeah. try to execute on it. Yeah. And I think to be honest, if you have the, if you have the attitude that, you know, you're going to dive into some cliches here, but you know, if, if, uh, if every, you know, even for you, you can learn from failure, basically uh, every failure is a success because you learn from it and you know, you can't, you can't, there's no better way to learn than to learn through failing. And I do really do feel like that. And I feel like I can't lose if, you know, even when I get to the point, when, uh, you know, I do, I'm, I'm, I never reach five watt per kilo, uh, or I, or I do a test when I'm supposed to reach it and I don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to learn so much more from that. Just attempting and you know, actually doing learning by doing than you know, uh, not having that goal in the first place. Yeah, man, there was something cool that came out of my mouth in this one podcast. Um, so what, one of my goals, these, you know, one of my goals is to compete in a triathlon, to compete in Ironman. And, um, I was, and I talk about a lot about my brand name. It's, I changed it to love the climb, mm. um, from go vegan Gitas to love the climb and, and it, and love the climb to me means like enjoying the process and loving the journey because, 
if someone handed me an Ironman finish or maybe handed you five watts per kilo, that would be cool, right? Like we, you know, we'd feel better about ourselves that we'd feel, we'd feel cool on social media showing those numbers. But like if someone handed that to us and we didn't put in the months and the hard yards for it, then like we don't really get much of the, re- the full return on it where it, most of the return is just that personal growth, the things you learn along the way. Absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, that, it's that billion dollar question where, you know, if, if someone gave you a billion dollars and you didn't have to do anything tomorrow, what would you do? And I think we would continue to do what we are doing right now, which is the important thing. And so let's keep on right. doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's good to stay hungry and just keep trying to grow personally. And if you, and if you fail, like, like, oh, well, I mean, you definitely still gained a lot from going after it. Yeah, dude. That is a wicked place to end this. Yeah, heck yeah, man. You're going to nail five watts per kilo. I (laughs) I already envision it, man. You got this. Yeah, I'm sticking to potatoes until then. (laughs) (laughs) Nice, man. All right, dude. Take it easy. And so good to speak to you. And I'll speak to you again soon. Yeah, you too, Ash. It was a pleasure. Peace.